Well, I think everyone is familiar with the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words of seeing is believing. This definitely not only applies to our daily lives, it also applies to the sciences, because it's probably not a coincidence <clears throat> in history that the resolution um, of, a, of the invention of the light microscope coincides in time with the beginning of the natural sciences as we know them today. Because with light microscopy, we were able to see for the first kind, time that every living being consists of cells as basic units of structure and function, and of course, organelles were discovered with the light microscope. However, uh, we've been told in school that resolution of a light microscope is fundamentally limited by diffraction to about half the wavelengths of light, and this is, of course, the reason why electron microscopy was invented. Now, there's no doubt about the fact that that really changed matters, and in fact, with an electron microscope, you can get a spatial resolution in a number of cases down to the size of a molecule. And therefore, the question came up, why do we still care for the light microscope and its spatial resolution now that we have the electron microscope? Now, the answer is actually given in the next uh, slide, um, where I made a little experiment comparing the number of studies that used in this journal uh, the electron microscope and the light microscope. And now you see which one of the two won. So, light microscopy still is the most popular um, uh, microscopy modality in the life sciences, and that's for very good reasons. The first reason, it's the only way by which you can look inside a living cell in three dimensions, minimally invasively, because light is very gentle um, to a living cell or living tissue. And there's, of course, another reason. There are thousands of different types of biomolecules in the cells, proteins and so on, and we want to know what a certain species is specifically doing. And in order to, to do that <coughs> very effectively, we hi have to highlight that species, and that is, of course, possible by attaching a fluorescent label. Now, if we attach that fluorescent label, of course, <coughs> then we can see the fluorescence that is generated by this label, because that label usually has an electron ground state, as you can see in here, an electron excited state. And if we shine light on it, for example, green light, then it can absorb a photon. The molecule is excited, goes up to this first electronically excited state. The atoms wiggle a bit, so there is some energy loss in the wiggling of the atoms. And this is why, when the molecule comes down, it emits a photon that is redshifted in wavelength. Now, this redshift in wavelengths, of course, is extremely useful because in this way, uh, fluorescence microscopy is extremely sensitive, so you can easily uh, separate uh, the fluorescent molecules from the, from the surrounding. In fact, it is so sensitive that you can see even individual molecules in a, in a, in a solid-state surrounding, as has been actually discovered by WE and also done by others. And this makes it so useful. But keep in mind, if there's another molecule, a second, a third, a fourth, coming closer together than uh, two and a nanometers to the first one, then it's not possible to tell them apart in a light microscope. And this is why it's clear that in a normal fluorescent light microscope, a lot of information is lost simply because we cannot tell features apart. So resolution is about telling features apart. It must not be uh, confused with sensitivity. So therefore, if we manage to find a way to overcome this diffraction barrier and sort out details at a very small scale, then we should be able to discover new things. Now, um, in order to do that, of course, we have to understand the problem um, at its very basics. And this is why it's worthwhile going one step backward and really boiling it down to the essence. So when I was a, uh, a student in physics, I've been told that you have to decompose the object to spatial frequencies and have to check out how many spatial frequencies are passed by the lens. Believe me, this is too complicated. The gist of the matter is this. The role of the lens is nothing but to concentrate the light in space. That means you have to ideally produce a point of light in here, but because light propagates as a wave, as we all know, it's not possible for the lens to concentrate the light on a single point. What will happen, we'll get a blob of light It is at least about 200 nanometers wide and about 500 nanometers along the optic axis. And a consequence of this diffraction phenomenon is that all the features that reside within this range will be flooded at the same time, more or less, with excitation light or with illumination light. And hence, if we do fluorescence imaging, they will also produce, say, fluorescent light, more or less, at the same time. So if we place the detector here, of course, we will not be able to tell the features apart, because they produce light basically at the same time. But the same applies also if we put a detector over here and image, so to speak, the fluorescence back onto a detector. Each of these molecules will also produce a blob of light because the light is also focused in here. 
And so it's not really possible to tell it apart from the neighbor, from that neighbor, from that neighbor. All the blobs of light will overlap basically here at the detector. So no matter what detector you place in here, photomultiplier, DI, or, or even a pixelated detector such as a camera, you will not be able to tell the signal from these features apart. Now, the person who realized uh, the, the problem of diffraction in, in all its aspects, actually, is this person, Ernst Abbe, who lived at the end of the 19th century, and he coined this diffraction resolution barrier in equation that is still named after him. It's basically saying, in order to be separable, two features of the same kind have to be further away than the wavelengths divided by twice the numeric aperture of the objective lens. And this equation can be found basically in any textbook of physics, optics, or uh, textbooks of natural sciences as well. And of course, it can also be found on a memorial that was erected in his honor in Jena, in Germany, where he lived and worked. And there it is written in stone. And this is, this is what people believed throughout the 20th century. And not only they believed it, it also was a fact. So when I was a student doing confocal microscopy at the end of the 80s, so the best resolution that you could get in those days from a cytoskeleton was this. And now, it's possible to get a resolution which looks like this, in this case done with stat microscopy. And so the question comes, why can we do this now, but maybe 10 years back we couldn't do that? I think it's very important to understand the transition and the, the essence behind the transition, because this will, will tell us what also will happen in the, next, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future, because these are the premises on which this development is based. Now, let's get back to the problem. So what was the problem? As I said, all the features are flooded at the same time with light and hence the produced signal in here. We cannot change that. That's a fact. That's a result of diffraction. But wait a moment. Is it, does it really mean that all the features that are flooded with light have to produce light at the detector? What if we manage to put some molecules into a state in which they are not able of producing light here at the detector? Let's assume we can place molecules in here into a state, call it a dark state, in which they would not shine light back, scatter light back, fresh light back, whatever. And then, of course, we should be able to separate the bright ones from the dark ones, because the bright ones do not produce signal, and the, and the dark ones do not produce signal, but the bright ones do. And in this way, we can separate them. So the key is not to change the way the light is focused, as people thought try to improve lenses, do something with light propagation, but to play with the state of the material that we look at, in this case, with the molecule. Okay, and now you will say, oh, dark state. Is there such a thing as a dark state in a molecule? Well, look at the energy diagram. It's a simple energy diagram. Every student uh, learns about this diagram. This is the ground state, this is the excited state. In order for the molecule to emit light, of course, it has to be in the excited state. So in other words, the ground state, is a dark state. So we do have a dark state. And then, especially if you train as a physicist, you ask yourself, how can I make dark state molecules? It's very simple. Not only you can pump up a dye from the ground state to the excited state, but you can also use light to get it from the excited state back down to the ground state. So there is a transition in any dye that allows you an optically driven transition that allows you to produce dark state molecules called simulated emission. You just pump the molecule down with light and make dark state molecules. And now you see what the idea behind this microscope, which is called STAT microscope, is. We use a beam of light not only for exciting molecules, but also for making molecules dark, making them go to a dark state or stay effectively in a dark state. And um, the scheme of this microscope is actually shown in here. We have a lens, we have the sample detector, we have light for turning the molecules on, so exciting them, getting them from the dark off state to the bright on state. And then, of course, they wiggle a bit, they end up here in this fluorescent state, but then, um, of course, they would produce, all of them would produce photons in here, so the signal from all these, uh, these uh, molecules would be confused because this is the diffraction spot that is produced here in the focal region of the lens, and so everything will be confused. But now, we use the beam for turning them off, for getting them to the, to the ground state. And the physical condition for that is uh, to use a redshifted beam because we have to couple it here from that state to a high vibration level in the ground state, so the, so the beam is not capable of exciting the molecules. And then, of course, what will happen, it will take away the majority of the energy in a copy photon, in a stimulated photon that goes that way. But it, the decisive thing is, the molecule is not seen as a detector. That's the point. And now, of course, we can turn the molecule off by applying this red beam of light. 
So wavelengths is one condition, but that's not sufficient. Of course, you have to make sure that there is a red photon that turns the molecule off. So there's a finite cross-section of interaction, of course, um, of, the, of the light with the molecule, but you have to make sure that it happens. And because this is the case, you have to apply a certain intensity that makes sure that there is always one photon at a molecule that kicks the molecule down, in the case you want to turn the molecule off. And this is why you have to have a certain threshold intensity to make sure that there is one acting photon at the molecule that kicks it down, so that in the end the molecule remains in the ground state, effectively. And so this is actually a fluorescence probability as a function of the intensity of the red beam, and you see, once you have an intensity that is higher or at this threshold IS, you've turned it off. And you can put green light as much as you want. In essence, the molecule will stay off, because as soon as it goes to the on state, it's instantly pushed back down to the ground state, and you will always find it in the ground state. Now, turning all of them off would be useless, of course. So what do we do? We have to make a selection of bright and dark molecules in here, and there's different ways of doing that. A simple way in this case, because we have circular symmetry in here, is to convert this red beam into a ring. So we put in a piece of glass that, that makes the light not fo be focused on a spot, but onto a ring. It's not a big deal. It's very done, easily done optically. And then we have this ring, and here we could turn the molecules off, of course, because there's a lot of red light. But here, if you go further down towards the center, here is a zero, you cannot turn them off because the red uh, beam is too weak, because most of the photons fly by, and then you don't see, you cannot turn them off. And so, what we, what we have to do in order to see just a signal from, the, from that fiber, for example, well, we have to turn off the molecules here and here. Now, making the beam smaller per se doesn't work because that's also limited by diffraction. But again, we don't have to do that. The only thing we have to do is we have to play with the states of the molecule. We have to turn the molecules off. So what do we do? We make sure that the intensity here at the inner part of the donut is beyond the threshold in absolute terms, although it's weaker in percentage, of course. And so we increase the intensity here in absolute terms such that, that uh, in, um, uh, the intensity here is beyond the threshold, then we turn those molecules off as well, and only those here at the center are left. And then we can separate the signal from this fiber from the rest. And this is actually how the concept works. And now if you want to see the whole object, what do we do? We scan the beams across the specimen, and now adjacent features, adjacent fibers, adjacent molecules are forced to emit sequentially in time because we force them to assume the on state time sequentially. They cannot emit at the same time. They cannot um, emit uh, 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 in synchrony simply because uh, they are on and off at different points in time. And in this way, we can separate the molecules and the features in here. Now, if you have a kind of physics, physical chemistry background, you can say what I'm doing here is actually a kind of uh, transition that I'm playing it in a nonlinear way. This is the thinking of the 60s and 70s, perhaps 80s of the last century. Believe me, if you really want to understand matters, what you should keep in mind that is what we actually do is we repair the molecules in two different states transiently for the time point of detection. And because we prepare them in two different states, become distinguishable, and then we can separate them. That's the essence of the matter. So, what, so here you have it actually. Here they are in the excited state. Here they are forced to stay in the ground state. So those molecules here, if you were to make a check, 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 where are they? You will always find them in the ground state because as soon as they get up, they're instantly down and so they stand, spend most of the time, 99% or so, in the ground state. And this is how we separate them. And this is, these are the molecules that are allowed to be in the on state. So two classes of molecules uh, are there for the time point of, of detection, in which we scrutinize actually that region. So, and this concept turned out to work. Um, so, um, putting the donut back so that you don't forget that there is light for turning the molecules off, it turned out to work. This is a standard confocal recording of something that you cannot really see what it is, and then this is the stat recording, and then you see these are uh, nuclear pore, pore complexes <coughs> that are labeled. Of course, we do fluorescence imaging. You can zoom in. You see the eightfold symmetry here in um, uh, in this uh, in this object, and uh, there is actually hardly any comparison with the standard confocal recording, which was, so to speak, the high end of the 
of the 20th century. And it shows you that you can go fundamentally beyond uh, the diffraction barrier, in this case, uh, roughly by an order of magnitude. Now, if you have a higher spatial resolution, then you can learn something. I think an area where, um, say, super resolution or nanoscopy, as it is called now, will have a serious impact is virology, simply because viruses are in the range of about 30 to 150 nanometers. So this is the first example where we teamed up with, um, with a group uh, specializing in HIV. So HIV is about 140 nanometers in diameter. And so uh, our collaborators were interested in a certain protein called ENV and how it's distributed on the uh, HIV particle. Confocally, you don't see anything but the patch. It's clear because the, because the, um, uh, the, the virus is uh, below uh, the diffraction barrier. If you do stat images, imaging, you see that, that these ENVs form patterns, and then you can correlate it actually with the maturation level of HIV. What has been found out is that mature HIV particles, they assemble their ENV proteins, there are about seven to 14 copies of these proteins on HIV in the same place. And this is at obviously required in order for the uh, HIV particle to infect the next, um, the next cell. This is one example. Now, a strength of, um, uh, uh, say, fluorescence microscopy, so lens-based fluorescence microscopy, is that you can do dynamical recordings. And um, this is now um, uh, actually a movie, a uh, very early movie showing actually that you can record um, uh, uh, synaptic vesicles here uh, at, um, at video rate with, uh, uh, with a high spatial uh, resolution. Okay, now uh, lifestyle imaging at the extreme is to go straight to a living system. And this is a kind of experiment where we did um, in order to see whether we can really go at least to the upper molecular layer, so to speak, at the, um, at, um, the brain of a, of a living mouse. And here, uh, this is actually uh, a recording. Uh, this is a transgenic mouse, some of its neuron expressed, uh, in this case, yellow fluorescent protein. And because the resolution is higher, roughly by about three to four um, than the best confocal or multiphoton uh, microscope, we can see actually quite nicely here um, the, uh, the, the, the spatial features. And not only that, they move also. You see, this is a movie. Um, now, since I <laughs> transferred, of course, the, um, the data, you see these black things again, but that's technical. Now, uh, it's actually quite nice to see that you can zoom in and see these features and that this, uh, these little uh, cup-like shapes, they move about. And this has been seen actually because of the high spatial resolution. You, you need a high spatial res resolution in, um, in order to see that. Now, um, the, the point I'm making here is that we have the resolution to really nicely see uh, here actually the dritic spines and these postsynaptic sites, and I'm very confident that in the end uh, we will be able to see the distribution of proteins and find out how they're arranged in space and perhaps give a visual cue even to the mouse and see what's going on chemically directly at the synapse, in this case uh, at a, uh, in a living system. So, uh, three-dimensional recording is, of course, possible. You can focus into, um, into the brain, of course. Um, this is about 30 microns uh, inside the brain tissue. So, these are organotypical hippocampal slice. And the point is that the high spatial resolution gives actually quite nicely the three-dimensional arrangement uh, of the actin here. Now, with that, I'm coming back to the basics again, uh, the resolution. And some of you will ask now, what is the spatial resolution that you get with the system? Is there a new boundary, a new border, so to speak? Now, in order to understand that, uh, I'm going back to the basic cartoon. I think it becomes clear from the way the concept works that uh, the spatial resolution is now, of course, not given by Abbe's equation anymore. It must be given by the dimensions in which the molecule is allowed to be on, in which the molecule is allowed to be, to be in the on state. And that region can be, can be made smaller, of course, just by increasing the intensity and shifting this threshold, of this off-switching threshold, so to speak, towards the center of, of that donut, if you like, and it's clear that this ratio I over IS, so the ratio of the intensity crest and the threshold intensity, which is, of course, a molecule characteristics, uh, um, will determine the spatial resolution. So, so it will be here in the denominator, because the larger it gets, the smaller D will get. And you see it here, if you will, in a modified version of Abbe's equation. The larger this, this gets, the smaller D will get. And in essence, it goes down to zero. It's worthwhile spending a second on this going down to zero. Let's assume we have two molecules. Can we separate them here? 
No, of course, because they are allowed to emit at the same time. But in principle, of course, we can make this even larger so that only one molecule fits into that hole in which the molecule is allowed to assume, assume the on state. And now we can separate, of course, this molecule from the neighbor simply because <clears throat> now they are forced to emit sequentially in time. By the way, one photon in principle, if this is totally dark, one photon is absolutely enough to know that there is a molecule or to, or to know there is no molecule if no photon comes. So this is very, um, very important to understand. Because we really determine actually position of the molecule by the presence of these many photons actually uh, in here. But the point I'm making is that the resolution limit is now obviously the molecule itself. It's the size of the molecule. And this is not surprising. We separate with molecules, so molecular states. So the molecule is the least separable entity. And this is why conceptually the limit, of course, is given by, by the size of the molecule, which is not bad if you think that initially it was about 200 to 300 nanometers. Now, you may ask, can you get that all the time? Is that routine, push button, get molecular resolution at one nanometer? The answer is no. So far, with that, the routine resolution is something between 20 and 40 nanometers, depending on the molecule, of course, because we play with the molecules and its molecular states. So it's a property of the molecule, the resolution that we get, not so much a property of the lens or, or, or detector and so on. This is a change in the way resolution uh, is made, actually. But, if you, of course, if you develop this method, you ask yourself, what do I need in order to get there? Well, I need a, a fluorophore that can be turned on and off many, many times. It need to be bright, but not terribly bright, as I said in this concept, because you don't need many photons, but you need to be able to turn it on and off. Now, organic molecules um, that we have so far, they are not perfect in that sense. You can turn them on and off um, a limited number of times, but they are inorganic molecules, so to speak, not molecules, but inorganic fluorophores, behaving kind of like atoms, like molecules. This is a um, um, uh, color center, in this case, uh, so-called NV center in diamond. And this can be turned on and off, basically, at will, as often as, as you want. And this has allowed us to, to go down to very small dimensions, so starting out from this to 4.2 nanometers, the smallest we made uh, three years back is something like 2.4 nanometers. And of course, this can be made larger. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that the development is, is going on. You can play with this concept, and, and it's very serious about going down to, to very, very small scales. Now, this may sound like a proof of principle experiment. To some extent, it is. But it's not only that. These color centers are actually quite interesting in the material sciences um, because um, these NV centers have a spin state. At room temperature, it has a relatively long coherence time, and you can play with the spin state. So it's a very hot, literally hot candidate for, for quantum computation. Uh, it's good as a magnetic sensor so at the nanoscale of atomic size. And uh, of course, in the end, you have to read it out. And this can be done here optically because it produces fluorescence. You can prepare it optically, read it out optically. And at some point, they will have to come very close because they want to read out nanoscale magnetic fields and that probably is the way of doing it. So it helps you breaking the diffraction barrier in the field of magnetic sensing if you use these little NV centers as sensors for magnetic fields, for example. So this is just to show you there's more than um, just, uh, say, labeling proteins and so on. Okay, I'm coming back again to the basic idea. Now, as I explained, the point is that we play on-off. It's an on-off game. This is the way we separate it, not focusing the light more sharply, turning things off to make them distinguishable. Now, when you realize this, and that's what I did actually quite early on, that this is on-off, it's not just about making stimulated emissions. Stimulated emissions is just one example of playing on-off. It's a very fundamental one, though, I should say, because these are the most basic states of a die. Pump it up, pump it down. There's hardly anything more fundamental than that. But it doesn't mean that's, that's the only one, as I said, and not always the best. There are other ways of playing on and off. You can pump a molecule to a long-lived dust state, metastable state, triplet state, or whatever. That's what I found in those days in the literature. This was a screening uh, textbooks on, on uh, molecular physics or play a cis game, a cis isomerization. And now you will ask, so this is obviously more special. This is more difficult to handle, and this is only found in certain certain compounds. So why, why not staying with this one? Now, why caring for, for those very special molecules and special transitions? Now, the answer is actually given here. Um, it's the lifetime of the states. The lifetimes of the states, as you can see, the involved states increases. So here, of course, nanoseconds. This is a lifetime of the excited state. Here, microseconds, metastable dark states. Here, even milliseconds. Why is this important? Well, it's very clear. As I said, we resolve by playing on-off. And we need to create a difference in states on and off 
in order to, to be able to read it out. But here, obviously, this difference in states lasts only for a nanosecond, because after a nanosecond, the molecule will have decayed, and then there is, they're all off, and then you cannot separate them. So the longer the lifetime of the states, the more time you have to create this difference in states and to read it out. And if you have something like an optically bistable, or a bistable molecule, create a, have a switch, then you have, of course, time to, uh, to read it out. And, and you don't have to put in so many photons per unit time in order to create this difference in states and read it out. So in other words, the longer the lifetime of the states, the, the less intensity you need, because the less photons you have to put in in unit time, or to, speak, to put it more formally so the threshold intensity goes down. So this threshold intensity here, um, in the case of STAT, because of the lifetime, was megawatt per square centimeter, here it goes down to kilowatt, and here it goes down to watt per square centimeter, so it's orders of magnitude, because you have more time, it means here the intensity goes down for the threshold, and also the intensity that you need in order to break the diffraction barrier. And this is very important in thinking, because it tells you the overcoming of the diffraction barrier is not an intensity game, it's a state transition game, and if you have the right state transition, you can do the job. So, this was very interesting, so I was very excited uh, following this <coughs> in the early uh, 2000s um, because you can also do it in a switchable, in a switchable fluorescent protein and uh, fluorescent protein switching actually was discovered uh, by W.E. Myrna in around 97, 98 that it was optimized because in my case I need many on-off transition cycles. As I said, I have to turn it on and off many, many times and so we had to develop in the end switchable fluorescent proteins that can do this, this transition uh, very often, uh, thousands of times. Eventually we managed, and this has allowed us to say, okay, since we need so little intensity, we can easily spread out the light over a large field of view and create many donuts. And that's one of the strengths of, of paralyzing things. And then, of course, um, is that a problem if you have many? No, of course. But I mean, what you do is actually you have to have the, this, this zeros further away than the diffraction barrier, then you can project it on a camera. Um, they will not interfere with each other because they can, are, they can be classically separated because they are further away than the diffraction barrier. And then, of course, you scan, and for each scanning step you have to read out a camera. So the image is, of course, composed of, of many images because it's a scanning procedure, it's a time sequential procedure. And then a few steps in this direction, a few steps in this direction, and you have taken an image. And this has been done in here. So here, uh, this, this living cell was quickly recorded, say within two seconds, over a relatively large field of view, with more than 100,000 donuts, so to speak, in parallel. Because, again, we need much less intensity, simply because we use the right transition. And this, again, tells us it's the molecule now that determines the contrast and the performance of the microscope is, again, not the optics anymore. The molecule is the decided thing because the molecular transition by which we produce, so to speak, the quality of the image. So with that, I'm coming sort of to the end. So what does it take to get the best spatial resolution? Now let's have assume you would have asked this question in the year 2000, or so 99. The answer would have been straightforward. Well, what do I need to get the best spatial resolution? I need good lenses. Of course, I need good lenses. Why? Because the separation is done by the focusing of light. And the better I can focus the light in here or, or in here, the better the image will be. It's very clear. Separation is done by focusing. But if you separate by focusing of light, then, of course, you are limited by diffraction. That's very obvious. And this is why people saw that's the end of the story. But what was the solution to the problem? Well, the solution to the problem was not to separate, of course, by focusing, or just by focusing, but separate by molecular states, by playing on off with the molecules and make the molecules separable. Because in that case, even if they overlap here in space here, I can tell them apart. The, those are emitting and those are dark. And I've shown you a set of state transitions that you can use to play this on-off game and tell these molecules apart. So that's the point. Now, um, here in this stat concept, of course, what we've done is we have used a pattern of light, say the donut, in order to create difference in states within the diffraction zone, as you can see in here. At, uh, that's a, a hallmark of, the, of these methods at very controlled positions. So we use a pattern of light, the donut, that tells us here the molecule has to be on, but here it has to be off. And in this way, of course, we know, of course, exactly where the molecule is on and where the molecule is off. We just read out single here, maybe one, two, three photons in principle, that's enough. And we have, have now the single from that molecule or from that molecule and so on. And in this way, of course, record the image. Now, um, the question comes up now, how does this compare with the other? 
seminal, uh, say, development, uh, which was actually first um, uh, realized by Eric Betzig, uh, based on the discovery of WE that you can detect single molecules. Now, here in this palm concept, the difference is, first of all, you create the difference in states on a single molecule basis within this diffraction zone. That's one thing. So the on-off game is played on a single molecule basis. And then, of course, it's played randomly. So that's quite distinct, actually, from here. It's played randomly. Randomly in space within the zone. You turn it on, you f hope to find it out, because you have to find out the position you turn it off. So if it's stochastic, how do you find out that the molecule is at this location? Well, I'm not using here in Palm the light that goes in. There is no such light that is structured. So I have to use the light that comes out. And this works if the molecule here is able to emit many photons in a bunch. So if you have many photons in here that you can project on a pixelated detector, like in a camera, then you can use, of course, the many photons, the pattern of light that is emitted in this case, in order to find out the position here of the molecule that had been uh, say statistically turned on within this diffraction zone. And without going into details, it means that if you calculate the centroid, if the pattern is bright, then you can, you can find out actually where the molecule is located using the coordinates actually given here by the camera. And then, of course, you, you turn it off and turn it on. So this is the number of photons. The higher it gets, the, the better the centroid. It's very interesting to, to, to compare it with here. Here the pattern is used for making the uh, coordinate here, and here it's the pattern that comes out of the molecule that is used for coordinate. So different types of patterns that are used, but you always need many photons, so to speak, to, to handle a coordinate in light microscopy. So you need many photons to know actually where the molecule is turned on and off or to find out where the molecule is located. In a way, you can say this I over S um, is the number of molecules that are capable of doing something. So IS is, as I said, the number of photons that I need to be sure there is one molecule that does something. So here, I over S is the number of photons that, that can do something. And you see kind of analogy. But the major difference is that here, many photons that go in, then make the coordinate. Here, many photons that come out, then make the coordinate. So that's uh, the fundamental difference. And you need many photons to handle a coordinate. Why? One photon goes astray within a diffraction zone. If this is a diffraction zone, statistically, of course, because of diffraction, one goes here, or it goes here, or it goes there. But if you have many, then you can calculate an expectation value, of course, and then you can handle a coordinate. So um, here it's enough to have one photon in principle. So we see the, the complementarity, actually, of the two concepts. Here one photon, here many photons. Here, in principle, one photon to turn it on, here many photons um, to turn it on and off. You can parallelize it, of course. So you can have many donuts, why not? Many zeros, and you can move it in parallel. But again, the difference is uh, you control it, you control the position, whereas here it's totally random, it's totally stochastic. Each of them has its strengths and weaknesses, and each of them are going to stay, that's very clear. But the point is the separation, that's the key, in all cases is done by state transition. So this is how we tell features apart. We make them go into different states for the time point of detection. And because they are in different states, we can tell them apart. And that's the essence of the whole field. So what we do in order to separate now, we transiently prepare the molecules in two different states in order to make them distinguishable. So in the 20th century, what did you need to do in order to get the best pictures? Good lenses, as I said, because separation was done by focusing. But now, it's not a focusing anymore. It's not the optical companies that will determine the spatial resolution in the fluorescent light microscope in the future. It's actually the chemistry. It's the chemistry that will determine it simply because it's the molecules and their states that give us the performance, that give us the spatial resolution and contrast and so on. Now, with that, of course, you can generalize the concept. You can say, OK, it's, does it need to be fluorescent non, and non-fluorescent just to this, this type of contrast? No, you can even expand it further, say absorption, non-absorption, scattering, non-scattering, spin up, spin down, or whatever, and then you can come up with, uh, say, a super resolution, I don't know what, scattering microscope, if you find the right states. And there is more work to be done. I think this journey is continuing. And with that, I'm acknowledging the people who have contributed to this development, and in the interest of time, I'm coming to the final slide. Well, obviously, uh, this equation has to be expanded. One way of doing it is to plugging in, is plugging in this square root factor, so I over S in the case of STAT, or if you will, to some extent, you can put in the number of photons. In the case of PALM, it's basically it, it's, it's very, very similar. Uh, but the point is that we, and that's the good news, now we can go down to the molecular scale. The molecule is the smallest separable entity, so that's, that's the 
fundamental change. And as I said, why can we separate now this fiber from that fiber? It's very simple. At the time the molecules in this fiber were on here, they were off. At the time they were on here, they were off here. Sometimes a difficult problem that lasts for many years can have a very, very simple solution. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Stefan, for a fantastic lecture and showing us that in the 21st century, chemistry and materials rules, whereas the physicists belong to the last century, so I have to move myself. Uh, sorry for that. So, I think yeah. we can allow one quick question and save the rest for the, for the panel discussion. So, we, we have, uh, of course, our, uh, our guest of honor, Bengt. No. Yes, I oh, okay. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, absolutely. I can imagine. So, so <clears throat> it's, it, it's, it actually goes into this direction that I try to convey at the end. So you can think about playing with other type of, of states. So as I say, playing with readback states or so, or changing the index of refraction, uh, polarizability or so on. And I think there is a future in it. It's not so straightforward as with fluorescence. Um, I'm very honest. When I looked into this problem, I didn't had the idea of improving fluorescence microscopy, or I definitely I didn't want to do something for the life sciences at the very beginning. I was in a solid state physics sort of department. Uh, I want to look at a problem. So I, I stumbled up, uh, across fluorescence simply because it was the easiest to do. So in a fluorescent molecule, you have states that you can play with. There's fluorescence and there's dark state. And so I realized I wasn't training fluorescence at all. But I, I realized that's easiest to do, and this is why I looked into fluorescence. By coincidence, it turned out to be important because there's life science who is interested in, in fluorescence. But, um, but there's more to be done, and I think this is one of the things that preoccupy me now. Um, is there any other, <clears throat> other transitions or so? And as you're saying, it has to be in the material so far. It's not a paradigm. Some, some, at some point, somebody may prove me wrong. And I don't know, but, but now the paradigm is play with the material that you look at, make it a part of the image formation, forget the light. People try to change the light, also near field optics, if you know, try to change it. That's hard, it's really hard. Let the light go out, let it, let it propagate. It wants to propagate, so why, why violate the light? Just play with the molecules, or play with the materials. I think that's, that's the future, and, and polarizability definitely is one, one um, option to look at. But it's harder, that's why it wasn't done. Okay, uh, let's thank Stefan Hell again.